Good afternoon and welcome to tonight's special educational webinar hosted by AMU. Our AMU host is having a little bit of technical issues and so I'm gonna go ahead and, and start our webinar off tonight. In tonight's program, uh, we'll review the key aspects and, and the recent impacts of the FDA's bronchoscope safety alert, as well as discuss evidence-based practices to safely perform bronchoscopy while perf uh, maintaining the safety of the patient and the healthcare team. <clears throat> I'd like to now brief you on the int uh, information regarding the continuing education program of tonight's program. Before we get started, I'd like to orient you to the functionality of the webinar system that we'll be using this evening. Today's program will be recorded and made available on the AMU website in about two weeks. During the presentation, all phone and computer lines are automatically muted. If you have a question for the speaker, please feel free to send all questions into the moderator via the chat box, which is located on the right side of your screen. Our guest speaker will answer as many questions as time permits. Tonight's webinar is accredited for one and a half hours of continuing education credit awarded by the California Board of Nursing. Terry Goodman and Associates is an approved provider for the California Board of Nursing. Within five business days of the conclusion of today's webinar program, you will receive an invitation to complete your online continuing education evaluation. In addition, Dr. Garrett has generously uh, created an ebook full of resources um, and provided the slides available, which are located on the handouts tab, tab of your screen on the right. So without further ado, a quick introduction for myself. Uh, my name is Hudson Garrett. I'm an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Louisville School of Medicine, and also sit in the Center for Infection um, Prevention and Training um, as well. So tonight we're gonna talk about what is really a really exciting piece, I think, as far as what the FTA has put out, and it's really a full circle uh, related to what's been going on in the GI space. We've seen this now in the urology space and finally in the bronchoscopy space. And it's really all about what we can do to take some of the lessons learned across all of these different medical devices and make this a safer practice for every single person involved, most notably the patient. Here's the continuing education information. Uh, again, this is available in your handouts, which are located on the right side of your screen. If for whatever reason you don't receive uh, that evaluation email, please feel, to, uh, feel free to email my team at the email address there, and we'll be happy to help you with any technical uh, issues that you might experience. Once you download um, or complete the CE process online, you'll be able to download that PDF of your CE certificate instantly. Um, if for whatever reason you lose that, not to worry, we do maintain those on file for five years and we're able to pull that for you if you ever need it for either licensure or certification purposes. Since we're offering CE for tonight's program, you can see my financial disclosures listed here. And a huge thank you to each of you. I really think that it's so important more now than ever to start every single conversation with our frontline healthcare providers with a huge thank you for the work that you do. Uh, the work that you've done over the last year and a half, regardless of what your individual role may be, um, is hugely helpful for all the patients, the communities that you serve. And it has been a very, very difficult time. I think we can all agree. One that I, I know I'm anxious and most of us are all very anxious to move on um, from this craziness of this pandemic. So our objectives for tonight's program, we're gonna first sort of dissect that recent FDA safety alert. And I'm also gonna take a step back to 2015 and really look at the historical aspects of this and where did this all originate from? We'll then spend some time talking about some evidence-based clinical recommendations that we can apply across the bronchoscopy space to really reduce both cross-contamination, but also that subsequent infection risk for healthcare-associated infections. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about ways that we can actually operationalize some of these FDA recommendations. You know, depending upon where your facility may be in the journey, um, it may be interesting to see where you start. You may enter at sort of stage one or stage two or stage three, which we'll talk about at the end of the program. But it's important to note that our end game, right, our end game for everything is to get to a completely safe device for that patient so that there's no uh, risk that's not necessary within the equation. So we'll sort of break this down by looking at device-related infection risk and sort of why did FDA come to this conclusion and, and, and specifically what brought them to the realization of putting out the safety alert. What can we do to sort of redesign the process in general and the procedure? Um, and lastly, you know, how can we advance sort of overall evidence-based practice and really learn the sort of buckets of things that we don't know versus the areas that we've got pretty good confidence that we know are, are known risk? So let's start with sort of what's new and what brought the FDA to this point in the first place. 
Well, FDA really has announced three general areas of focus for improving medical device safety, right? And this really goes back to their efforts back in 2014, 2015. And they said they wanted to sort of, you know, look at these three areas, put resources behind them, look at them from both a regulatory and a compliance standpoint, but also put out better guidance for manufacturers to really figure out what are the right ways to sort of reduce overall risk as they relate to things like device design. Um, how can the FTA look a little bit deeper with reprocessing standards, as an example? And lastly, and probably the most important, is what can we do from a public health standpoint, a clinical practice standpoint, materials management, industry, et cetera, to improve overall collaboration? We recognize that this is a problem that has a lot of different moving parts, right? Think about this like a, a wheel on your bicycle. You've got lots of spokes. Um, and each of those spokes represents an individual part of this equation. And if we don't address all of these things, we're gonna sort of look at a smaller uh, benefit than what could be much, much larger and more sustainable in improving overall patient safety. So that sort of le uh, led to this initial safety alert, which we'll talk about in 2015 first, and then we'll talk about the most recent one here second, right? And remember that these FDA safety alerts are normally driven based on uh, medical device reports, right, of adverse events. So they're lo really looking at those MDR reports to say, oh my goodness, we have sort of an increase or a trend associated with these. Uh, maybe there's some patient harm, maybe there's not, maybe there's device failures, maybe there's not, but it's really not looking at true causality. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a second. So all of these MDR reports don't necessarily go back to causality, but they're quite alarming when you look at both the number um, as well as the types of reports that FTAs looked at. So sort of keep in mind our frame of reference for tonight's conversation is there's really sort of two different flavors that are out there, right? You've got sort of that single use or disposable bronchoscope or you have the traditional reusable. And certainly reusable make up the bulk of the market, especially in the United States, but also globally. Um, and we'll talk about sort of the pros and cons of both here uh, this evening. But one of the things that we're gonna really focus in on is that MDR reporting around reusable bronchoscopes and break down a little bit in more detail and granularity, what are the real reasons behind uh, why we see some of the issues that we do? So back in March of 2015, um, the FDA really looked very detail-oriented um, at medical device validation, specifically looking at reprocessing. And they had a couple of concerns. Um, and this was not at all related to only endoscopes, but it was really looking at sort of the broader trend of medical device reprocessing and essentially were they doing enough to both validate the device before it became on the market, but also really looking at it from a post-market surveillance standpoint. And we know that we don't have the absolute best reporting systems once a device is in the healthcare marketplace. Um, sometimes we just don't get good data. Sometimes people don't report that information either to the manufacturer or to the FDA. But what we've also found is that reprocessing is sort of a flawed process in general. Uh, whether that's due to personnel issues, uh, the device itself, the equipment that's used within that process, there's lots of different ways that this process can sort of go off the tracks. So in September of 2015, shortly thereafter, the FDA issued their first safety alert, really looking specifically at uh, reprocessing of bronchoscopes. And it was really targeted primarily at the healthcare audience, uh, really not at all designed for the patient, but you'll see that there's gonna be some mention of patient responsibility here, right? And remember that I mentioned earlier that these safety alerts are almost always driven by either some type of analysis of MDR data, some type of outbreak within the clinical setting, or unfortunately, we've also seen some legislative issues where there's been investigations that then drove the FDA to issue safety alerts as well. And that's actually what drove a lot um, of the GI um, you know, endoscope issues with the duodenoscopes and ERCP. So back from you know, 2010 to 2015, the FDA really sort of combed back through those MDR reports. And they were looking specifically at you know, failed reprocessing, were there um, some type of complications, where there's device contamination, uh, was there known or suspected healthcare associated infections? And they found that there were over 100 you know, MDRs um, concerning infections or device contamination within that time frame specific for bronchoscopes. Right? Now that may number may not sound like a lot, but in, in the big sort of scheme of things, it really is, right? And we also know that it's underreported. 
Uh, one of the other things that is not broken down in the FDA's alert is sort of the severity of each of these MDRs. Uh, you can go look at that individually, but it's very limited to um, what is actually reported by the healthcare facility or the healthcare provider. Um, so, you know, something to think about. Then in 2014, the FDA then received about 50 more MDRs that actually mentioned the word infection or device contamination, right, associated with bronchoscopes. And when we start to see sort of this word analysis, right, where you see the mention of um, infection or some type of other adverse event, this is normally what's going to trigger those post-market uh, researchers within the FDA to say, wait a minute, we may potentially have an issue associated with this category of devices. Uh, we can also look at the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, we found that there's many, many instances where this type of incidence is reported within the peer-reviewed literature, but it may not have been actually reported to the government agency itself. So think about the overall sort of process associated with reprocessing of reusable devices. And we'll sort of, you know, again, look, use bronchoscopes as our example tonight. But at the very top, you'll see that there's different individuals that are gonna be involved in that process. Whether it's a reprocessing technician that's in a reprocessing suite, maybe it's a bedside nurse, it could be a, a procedural technician, and then certainly we're gonna have our SPD technicians. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is the multiple places where things can go wrong, right? Whether that's sort of at that bedside cleaning, the disinfection process that takes place within the, uh, the uh, reprocessing suite. We've got the rinse, especially with bronchoscopy. We know that waterborne pathogens are a huge risk associated with that. And we've got devices that are not really well designed. Um, and so these reusable devices are pretty problematic about waterborne pathogens. And then lastly, you know, sort of that dry and storage process. Can we, you know, reliably get out all of the moisture that's trapped within that device? Um, what about those waterborne organisms like Pseudomonas? Um, and then how are those devices gonna be stored, handled, and maintained? And we'll talk specifically tonight about maintenance um, because we know that that's gonna be one of the big risk factors um, associated with uh, infection risk. So from that, they, they sort of tore this apart and said, what in the world is potentially causing this increase in MDRs and subsequent infections and reports of contamination? And they found that a lot of this may have gone back to, well, people weren't following the manufacturer's instructions for use. Uh, and that certainly is a component of that. But even with recent data associated with duodenoscopes, we found that even individuals that were properly trained, following the manufacturer's IFUs, we still saw bad outcomes associated with that. So we can make the same correlation with the bronchoscopy area, right? And so that sort of lack of pre-cleaning, that buildup of bio burden or soil, um, certainly if you have a biofilm that adheres to those devices can be very problematic with other body tissues. Um, we also see issues with uh, devices that are passed through the bronchoscope uh, that may actually damage the channels, for example. What about if they don't actually follow the manufacturer's instructions for reprocessing? And let's say they do low or intermediate level disinfection versus high level, or maybe they sterilize the device, but it's not designed for that and it starts to warp and break down. Uh, and then we have some type of adverse event where somebody has an issue or a part falls off in the lung. We can also see issues with some of the accessories that are used, right? Maybe we don't use the proper brush to flush those channels and get rid of that uh, tissue that might be left behind, that blood or body fluids that might be there. We can also have issues associated with the cleaning and reprocessing products. I remember investigating an outbreak several years ago where we went in and they said, well, we're not, we're not seeing um, any problems here, but we keep having infections. And it turned out that their HLD product uh, had been expired for over two years, right? No one had checked it. And so it was not putting an ounce of efficacy into the system. Um, and then lastly, especially with our waterborne pathogens, we know that if we don't get that, that bronchoscope dry, it can be extraordinarily problematic. Um, and we can have those waterborne pathogens that can exist there. So what about equipment integrity? You know, whether it's your device that you own, lease, or it's a loaner device, these bronchoscopes we know can have equipment challenges. Um, we can have breakdown of channels, we can have seals that are not properly there. Uh, we can have holes, cracks, and gouges. Uh, you may have refurbished parts. Maybe you're sending these things out to a third-party reprocessor um, or some type of uh, repair um, depot. You could have all kinds of issues associated with that. I remember seeing a loaner device that had uh, some patient tissue from where we don't know, but it was actually inside the device um, at the time. 
And so, you know, this can be hugely, hugely challenging and a big legal liability, especially for devices that are not yours. So yes, you may receive a loaner device and reprocess it, but do you really have an idea of how well that device has been maintained, right? And so that's sort of an inherent risk associated with reusable devices and one that was called out uh, by the FDA back in 2015. So they did have sort of two core mentions for recommendations for patients. Um, one was really sort of discussing those risks and the benefits, which is something we already do as part of that informed consent process, right? You know, this is something that's standard of care. We're going to always do these types of things. Um, but really the question is, is are the practitioners and the physicians especially equipped to have that conversation? Do they truly understand the risk? Do they understand what is taking place within that institution to reprocess the devices, right? And then sort of the after effect is what happens if, what happens if I develop a fever? What happens if I develop some adverse event signs and symptoms? How should I sort of, you know, report that and deal with that? And are the average clinicians that see those patients going to then trigger an MDR report to the FDA based on the fact that this individual had a bronchoscopy and there may be a subsequent issue with those devices, right? The more um, active and, and proactive we can get with these devices, and sort of isolating and quarantining those if there's a potential issue, the more likely you are to sort of keep that catchment of impacted patients a lot smaller. Um, you know, this could be the difference between having a conversation with two or three patients versus several thousand. Um, and so it's really important to be on the lookout and be extraordinarily vigilant um, as we're looking for associated risk. So they did talk about some things that they would do as a regulatory agency, meaning FDA. Right, they would continue to monitor the MGR reports. And, and I'll tell you that, you know, while the FDA does a, a great job with regulatory review and things like that, they've got a lot of room for improvement in the sort of sense um, of monitoring after the fact. And, and certainly there's staff and resource challenges and all that type of stuff. So there, a lot of this burden is gonna fall back on us as the healthcare practitioners to make sure that we're not only reporting it to the agency and to the manufacturer, but more importantly, we also publish it in the literature. Um, you know, and sometimes that may be a little bit risky and your legal counsel may say, no, absolutely not. But this is really the way that we share best practice and learn from failures and optimize the potential solutions. You know, one of the other things too is to sort of better understand the true challenges of reprocessing. I remember sitting in a meeting with the FDA and I said, have any of you ever reprocessed a bronchoscope? Have any of you ever reprocessed a duodenoscope? Uh, and they sort of stared at me and they said, no. And I said, yet yeah, you're making rules and regulations for these devices and you have absolutely no idea how they're used clinically um, and certainly not how they're reprocessed, right? And so these are opportunities where we can say, we need to understand the process personally before we can make recommendations. Um, so this is not a management from afar uh, type thing. And, and certainly they've strengthened the regulatory review process, but FDA really sort of stood up and said, we want a better device in the first place, right? And we'll talk about that here in just a second. The third one that you'll see here is really looking specifically at taking that 2015 reprocessing validation guidance to actually say, how do we optimize this? Are there ways that we can improve the reliability? Is what the manufacturer is actually putting forth actually going to work? Um, is it something that's sustainable? Can the average person reproduce these results? And that really leads into where we are now in 2021, talking about human factors, engineering, and validation. The sort of next one is, is really looking at reprocessing and device re design, right? There was an initial emphasis, whether it was the GI scopes or bronchoscopes or rheology scopes to say it's completely device design related, right? It has nothing to do with the practitioners, the clinicians, the usage, um, you know, the processes that they goes through. But we found very quickly that that was not true. Um, it really is a multifactorial sort of issue that we have to face together. And then lastly is that piece of collaboration that we mentioned early on in tonight's program. How do I get all the right stakeholders to the table to have a conversation, right, and really do this? And I'll give you an example of where this did not work. So several years ago, the FDA said we're a little bit concerned with third-party reprocessing and, and repair associated with endoscopes. And it wasn't specific to any type, but they just wanted to look at endoscopes. And so they invited third-party professionals and companies they invited hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers, and they invited device manufacturers, um, as well as some public health and infectious disease professionals. And we found very quickly that the third party companies had no interest, right, in sort of revising what they were doing, because currently they're not regulated by the FDA.
Um, and so there was a huge incentive for them to stay that way. Um, but in reality, we know that if we're going to get better compliance and sort of surveillance of potential infection risk, we need to get everybody that's handling these devices under a similar infrastructure so that we can look for problems before they ever become an issue. So back on June 25th, uh, the FDA issued a second safety alert, right, which is really the premise of why we're here this evening, that updated some of those recommendations um, on reprocessing associated with flexible bronchoscopes and also provided some additional solutions. Right back in 2015, there were no commercially available solutions that really met what FDA was hypothesizing was going to help eliminate the risk. And we're going to talk about different ways to look at that. So there was new MDR data that was made available, right? One of the things that they wanted to look at again was an updated MDR review to really look specifically at bronchoscopes um, to better understand, you know, sort of how are these things playing out? Where are the infections? Are they in inpatient settings, outpatient settings? Are they at the bedside in the ICU? Are they in the pulmonology suite? And so from, you know, basically 2015 to January of this year, right, the FDA received almost 900 MDRs related to infections or device contamination specific for bronchoscopes, right? So you can see the difference between what we found in the five years between 2010 and 2015. So this is a pretty marked increase. Right now, there certainly is going to be more reporting because hopefully we're getting better about reporting. But we also know that there's inherent risk associated with these reusable devices. Um, and so we're going to sort of break down those factors here. But not understanding what those manufacturers' instructions for use are, absolutely one of the top. Um, device integrity issues, for sure. And then, you know, things like mechanical maintenance and what does that need to look like? And what we found is the most frequently uh, causal organisms were mycobacterium, which is in the tuberculosis family, pseudomonas, which is a huge waterborne organism, serratia, which is a common former for biofilms and medical devices, and klebsiella, which can, which can also be in the CRE family. So again, this was a wake-up call to say it's not a problem isolated um, to one particular type of devices, but it is also found in the bronchoscope uh, area too. So out of those reports, right, there were seven reports of deaths. Um, again, there's not direct causality because the MDR reports don't establish causality. They're simply reports provided by the healthcare practitioner or the facility. Um, one of those uh, deaths was related to the patient's underlying pathology, right? So if, just similar to what we're seeing with COVID right now, or if you've got folks with significant comorbidities, uh, we know that this is going to be a potential challenge. Um, one of those is reported um, the patient was involved in a MDR cluster, right? And that actually was tied back to the bronchoscope. And again, when we look at Klebsiella specifically, we know that that is a very, very common pathogen that we find in endoscopes. Um, and so that is no surprise to me here. And then two additional uh, reports of the MDRs did not give us enough details to make causality determination. But again, if you have a cluster of illness, particularly with MDRs, those multidrug resistant uh, organisms, we know that these are going to be one of the biggest possible risk um, associated with outbreaks. And again, we want to try to intervene as quickly as possible, but sometimes we don't have the ability to do that without good surveillance. So just an important note that I want to make sure I'm very clear about, that just because there's an MDR report, right, doesn't mean that there's true causality back to the device. Um, in some instances, like that second one that I mentioned, there was. Um, it was, you know, tied back genomically uh, to the organism, to the patients, to the device itself. Um, I've done those types of investigations myself, and they are extremely cool to see because it gives you a really cool idea of where did the actual infection originate so that you can actually go back and fix it, right? And so, again, we're just making sort of uh, generic comments based on the MDR data uh, that was presented to the FDA. So in this new 2021 recommendation, there were some updated patient recommendations, and it really builds nicely upon what was already in there um, from the 2015. Uh, one of the things is really having that open, transparent conversation with that physician to say, what are the true risk and benefits? Uh, what is being done to mitigate the risk associated with device-related infections? Um, are there circumstances where individuals really may not be the right candidate? Um, to do that, right? It, you know, that's something that we've really got to think about specifically. Um, you know, there may be instances associated with that for sure. One of the other things to look at too is sort of that post-procedure follow-up. Uh, we know that especially in that 30-day bounce-back window, 
there may be instances where patients may either present back to their pulmonologist, uh, they may present back to the intensive care, uh, they may present back to the emergency department, right, after hours or on a weekend, and they may have some uh, signs and symptoms that could be associated with some type of device-related infection. It may also be a complication associated with that as well. And so reporting that information back to the provider is an obligation of the patient, but it's only gonna be effective if we actually teach them what we're looking for. Right. If you spike a fever, if you start to have shortness of breath, um, if you've got a lot of mucus or phlegm, for example, these are all ways that we can get better data out of the patient and understand this. And I'd really encourage us to look at things like uh, reporting apps and tools that are electronic so it makes it super easy. And probably the best example of this is what CDC's done with vSafe uh, for the COVID-19 vaccine, where you can really do real time uh, feedback back to the agency to say what's your experience with the COVID vaccine. There are commercially available apps that allow us to do that post bronchoscopy, uh, which is a great solution. So what about sort of the different levels of disinfection? And this is where I think it gets a little bit interesting, right? And we may be doing various levels of these disinfection practices within our bronchoscopy suite, certainly within the intensive care setting, the ER, wherever it may be, at different places. Um, and so it may also be different individuals involved in this. But if we think about sort of general cleaning, right, it's the simple removal of buyer burden or soil. It's not killing anything. So if I'm doing bedside cleaning of that bronch, uh, that bronch then I, I'm trying to remove that bio burden or soil. I'm trying to prevent something from becoming a biofilm and adhering to the device. We really don't use lower intermediate level disinfection on any medical device. We use that primarily for environmental surfaces. So if you're using you know, your disinfectant wipes and sprays uh, to disinfect those environmental surfaces, then you're gonna fall within those sort of categories. Our baseline sort of entry level for reprocessing of these uh, uh, bronchoscopes is going to be high level disinfection, right? And remember that high level disinfection is not going to kill everything. It's very effective and it, and it kills a lot of things, but it's not going to take care of all the bacterial spores. There will be things that will be left behind and the margin of safety between that and sterilization is really, really small. And so it only takes one small deviation or one process failure or one chemical not to work um, or somebody not to follow instructions for you to have a breach. Right, and so with sterilization, we're trying to eliminate all known microorganisms with the exception of prions. Um, and so again, we're trying to get to what's the safest level for the patient, um, especially if we're still using reusable devices. So the sort of next part of their recommendation was really what I call stepping up that reprocessing game, right? You know, are there things that we could do in addition to high level disinfection, which yes, is standard of care, but we just talked about the fact that there's not, a not enough margin of safety in order to really be aware of this, right? And so we want to do everything that we can to sort of stack the deck in our favor, right? So sterilization does that, but sterilization is only gonna be as effective as we clean the device, right? So if that, bron that bronch is not cleaned and we just run it through a sterilization cycle, where we're sterilizing in place a dirty instrument with bio burden or soil, and that can lead to buildup. So we always wanna consider sterilization if at all possible. We certainly would need to check with the manufacturer to say, is this even something that's possible? Um, and I, I've done many testing um, sort of parameters with sterilization of, of all different types of endoscopes and they just don't survive very well. They weren't designed for that. Um, and so that really leads us to what sort of that next level of efficacy that we could have. Um, you know, one of the other things too is looking at the types of chemicals and solutions are used in tap water. Um, as an example, is that water filtered? Uh, we know that just regularly admissible water is very, very riddled with waterborne pathogens that, you know, are fine for drinking, um, but they're not going to be fine for a medical device. And so that's important to consider. And then lastly, we've got to really be very vigilant about, are we following those instructions for use? Are we using the approved parts and replacement pieces? Um, are there other things that we might be doing to save time and money that unfortunately may actually be putting that device at risk for causing harm uh, to a potential patient? So what about device damage? Um, you know, if you go back and look at medical device outbreaks in general, right, whether it's surgical instrumentation, endoscopes, you know, the list goes on, most often when they're torn apart and analyzed by a factory technician, they can pretty quickly determine there are many, many different pieces that are broken, things that have not been properly maintained, seals and O-rings that are not properly sealed, right, can all lead to an issue.
right? And so if you ever have a damaged device that's visibly damaged or that fails the leak test, then we shouldn't be using it. Um, we need to follow the manufacturer's instructions, remove that device from service and get it serviced appropriately. Um, you know, we've also got to look for some visible things. You know, are there things falling out of the device? Um, are there kinks or, or bends? Um, are there holes or cracks? Do you see other types of wear or tear externally? One of the things that I, I've seen a lot of people use here in the last few years is a borescope. Um, and while borescopes are cool and they have a lot of utility, I sort of equate them to really looking at a chest X-ray if you've never learned basic radiological imaging. Um, if you don't know what you're looking at, it is very difficult to interpret the image. Um, and so we've got to either figure out a way to better interpret the image and design that process where people can be competent. Um, but what I found is that many manufacturers of these reusable uh, Bronx don't have a clue what really requires it to come in um, and be serviced. And so they'll basically say, if it's damaged, send it back to us. Um, and we need to know sort of the severity. Are there certain things that can keep, you know, keep the device in play? Are there areas where you have to say, absolutely not, it needs to be sent back immediately in quarantine? Uh, those types of things are sort of unanswered questions. So what about moisture retention, right? We, we know that this is another big risk and especially in a dark device that's black and it's really not designed to allow any type of, of air in there um, or sunlight, for example, we, we know that there's gonna be buildup, right? And so anytime there's water sitting in a device that's dark, um, it is a great natural habitat for waterborne pathogens to, to grow, uh, particularly Pseudomonas. And so the recommendation from FDA is pretty generic if you ask me, right? They're really saying, you know, do what you can to minimize the likelihood of contamination or the collection of moisture but that is really all up to you and the manufacturer. And a lot of manufacturers don't provide detailed instructions about how to store these devices other than if they need to be vertical or horizontal, um, can they be you know, coiled up, that type of stuff. But anytime I walk into a reprocessing area and I see under pads, for example, underneath scopes, that instantaneously tells me that we have an issue. Right, because you're gonna have mold and all kinds of other waterborne issues associated with that. There are some different technologies out there that do sort of force air dry uh, these devices and they work very effectively um, as long as you're following those instructions, but they can take up to 10 minutes, right? And so that may not be very feasible in a reprocessing room where you have one technician that is trying to uh, return these bronchoscopes to service as quickly as possible. So I always look at sort of this um, approach of infection prevention and control and, and apply this in sort of two different logics. One is I can react to every situation that's thrown at me. I can say, oh my gosh, we have an outbreak. Um, or I can be on sort of the left side of this screen and say, I'm gonna be proactive in my approach. I'm gonna stop that contamination from ever occurring. I'm gonna prevent the microorganism from ever becoming a, a causal link, right? And there's different ways to do that. Um, but it really is helpful to be on that side of the fence. You don't wanna be on the side where you're really dealing with that outbreak or that potential lawsuit. You're being subpoenaed in court and ask all kinds of questions about, well, how did you, you know, sort of come to this realization? Did you know about the FDA safety alert? Uh, what did you do after that? Did you do an assessment of your practice, right? And, and every time I see an FDA safety alert, my first sort of thing that I wanna do on my to-do list is to do a, sort of an analysis of my current practice. Am I seeing the things that are mentioned in that FDA safety alert? Um, if I don't initially see those, it doesn't mean they're not happening. It just may actually mean that I'm not seeing them. And so I may have to sort of approach each scenario slightly differently in order to actually get a little bit of visibility to what might be going on. So here's one of my favorite areas of the FDA safety alert, and it's really sort of centered around preventative maintenance, right? So they're sort of deferring back to the manufacturer to say, what's the right cadence and incidence of getting these devices preventatively main maintained? Um, you know, how often do those parts seem to be uh, swapped out as an example? Um, are there recommendations? What if they're not? Uh, what should I do as a facility? Should I do something annually? Uh, should I do something more frequently? Uh, should I not do anything at all? And sort of from an infection prevention standpoint, I want to know what steps are actually performed during that preventative maintenance. Uh, for example, if I know that all the channels are ripped out and replaced, um, then that's helpful for me to know if there's ever an outbreak. Um, I know that that should be an area that has been properly uh, maintained, assuming that it's done at the right cadence. 
you know, these devices may also be used at different frequencies. And so you may have a device at hospital A that is used maybe a couple times a month, but you have another device at hospital B that's used probably five or six times a day. Um, and so it's important to know what those preventative maintenance requirements are, is it by number of hours of the machine being used, um, number of procedures, and, and some manufacturers I found just simply don't have any recommendations at all. And that's really problematic. Um, if we don't have an idea from the manufacturer and they've not validated that, then that can be very, very difficult. And I'll tell you, even in the very risky space of ERCP in the GI world, uh, there were no standard recommendations for ERCP uh, devices, right? So those duodenoscopes did not have a recommendation prior to just recently with the FDA saying these will be inspected by the manufacturer at least annually. And I, and I think that can be you know, directly extrapolated here that at a minimum, these bronchoscopes should be inspected by the manufacturer at least annually. Um, and, and that can be a big, a big to do, um, especially when you think about the number of devices that might be out there in the market. So what about routine inspection? You know, you're gonna have to develop, again, in collaboration with the manufacturer, some process in place for routine inspection and maintenance. Maybe that's every 90 days. Maybe that is, you know, at the end of every month. Maybe you're gonna, uh, you know, put a borescope through the bronch um, and actually try to determine whether or not you see any type of channel gouging or anything like that. Um, I've got to know that I've got proper policy and procedure in place to handle everything from my normal day-to-day -day activities like reprocessing and training and validation and equipment checks, all the way up through protecting my staff. If there's one thing we've learned through from COVID. Um, hopefully, it's been that we cannot afford to not protect our healthcare workers. Um, you know, knowing that we didn't have PPE at work one day, I, I thought, how in the world did this possibly happen? Um, and then, of course, we ran out of toilet paper. <laughs> and so then I, I've learned to never just, I just never assume. Um, things can happen. And so, again, we're trying to make sure that we figure out the right cadence associated with this. And again, my experience has told me that most manufacturers do not have an established routine inspection policy um, or sort of the cadence by which this should be done. And so the manufacturer should ideally define that, right? And in that inspection, you want to look at both the internal and the external parts. Maybe that requires them to send a service technician on site. Maybe you have to send those devices back to the company and actually get a loaner device. Um, and then sort of lastly is who's going to validate staff competency? Um, you know, preferably if I can get the company to come in and do it, then I want them to do it because legally they're going to be a lot more, um, you know, well-trained on this topic. It's their product. And then I'm going to have their sign off that those individuals receive proper training. Now, does that guarantee that that individual will be able to perform, you know, 30 days from then? No, but it does give me a higher level of confidence as the manager at the facility to say, at least I know that they were properly trained. Now, whether or not they follow those recommendations, um, you know, that's a whole different ball game. So what about single use devices, right? You know, and so if you think about this, single use devices can theoretically be in two different forms, right? You can have a sterile device or you can have a non-sterile device. Um, and certainly I, I would always lean towards a sterile device, but you also have to make sure that people don't do crazy things like reprocess those single use uh, bronchoscopes. Uh, you know, we've seen this happen with pretty much every type of surgical instrument where somebody grabs it and thinks, well, I'll just get another usage out of it, or we didn't use it, so we'll use it for the next patient, and they try to reprocess that even though it's labeled for single use. Now, just to be clear, there are some single-use devices that do have FDA clearance to be reprocessed. We're, those are not in this space, um, but I just wanted to make sure that we did cover that. So, you know, a couple of questions to think about, both from the provider standpoint but also from the patient's perspective is, should all patients just get a single use device? Um, you know, I, I can tell you for myself, if I have a choice, um, I want a single use device. I, I just don't wanna have the risk of someone else's pathogens being in that device. And also I'm a little bit biased because of what I've seen. I've seen the very, very poor reprocessing practices and, and by no means is that an assault on the reprocessing personnel. Uh, in many instances, the reprocessing personnel were following the exact steps they were told to by the manufacturer. Um, and so the system has innately set them up for failure. Um, and so the more that we can do to eliminate human variability in this equation, the better off we'll be at reducing overall risk of infection and cross-contamination.
right? You know, what are things that you can do to prevent accidental reprocessing of single use devices? Um, you know, is there a way that you can tag that device to make sure that it does go in the trash? Um, do you have sort of a chain of custody where you can ensure that it, it is discarded, right? And then we also need to see more reimbursement of single use uh, devices, particularly bronchoscopes. You know, if insurance is going to pay for that and the patient is educated and the clinician is educated, then it's a win-win for everybody. Um, but cost can sometimes be a barrier um, associated with those types of things. AABIP also put out during COVID sort of additional recommendations that build upon this, really looking at some of the risk associated with just bronchoscopy with COVID-19. And, and good news is that, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus which causes COVID-19 infection is pretty easily killed, right? So our normal HLD and certainly sterilization or sterile device is going to take care of that, but it's also about the risk to the healthcare team that is in the room, right? And, and again, if we go back to what we've learned from COVID, we know that there are just so many fundamental challenges associated with um, COVID that there's just been risk. Um, risk to healthcare providers, risk to patients, risk to families. Um, and so anything that we can do in our power to reduce um, risk, you know, especially with aerosolization during these uh, aerosol generating procedures is going to be very, very beneficial. And, you know, sort of from that, we've got to think about that risk versus benefit equation. Is the benefit going to outweigh the risk? Um, do I have a patient that really needs this procedure? Yes, maybe I do. Um, are they going to be able to tolerate anesthesia as an example? Maybe they can't. Right. And so that's sort of where that seesaw effect comes back and forth. And we have to have those conversations with our patients. We have to tell them that there are known outbreaks associated with reusable bronchoscopes. Here's what we're doing. Um, or maybe we're using a single use sterile device as an example. Um, and if we have had infections, we sure as hell better be learning from them. Um, we better be figuring out what are sort of the nuances associated with how that infection happened, right? Was it associated with personnel? Was it competency driven? Was it a process issue? Uh, was it a lack of accountability? Was it, you know, equipment and supplies? Um, and so all of those things go back into this sort of conversation. So the new FDA recommendations in this most recent safety alert do actually call out that we should be considering the use of a single use bronchoscope right, if there's going to be increased risk for spreading infection. So think about those high-risk patients, particularly those with known either current um, or in the past multidrug resistant organisms, uh, certainly our, our population that's immunocompromised, uh, patients with prion disease, because we know that those devices have to be discarded, right, or in general, we can look at this as sort of standard of care. Um, again, if I'm the patient, I'm going to be asking these questions. Uh, obviously, I'm a little bit different than the average consumer because I'm very well aware um, of the risk associated with this. But even when I go to get my local flu shot, I make them draw up the flu shot in front of me so I can see that sterile needle and syringe come out of the package. I can see them disinfect the septum of that vial. Um, and so we start to see more and more patients get educated, right? And so this is extraordinarily helpful. Um, and I think it really honestly goes well beyond COVID, right? COVID is super easy to kill, as I mentioned. It's not about that. It's really about the overall risk to the device and how likely are we to actually get it clean and disinfected every single time. Um, and our patients have different expectations. So what about monitoring every processing? You know, this can be a whole hodgepodge of different approaches. Right, you may have some type of just-in-time reprocessing validation with some type of channel check as an example. You've got some type of you know, ATP swab is another one that comes to mind where you're trying to determine whether or not that device was properly reprocessed. Remember that many of these devices are not effective after HLD. They're really effective for evaluating sort of the cleanliness of the device prior to HLD. So just make sure that whatever you may be using um, is appropriate for the type of process outcome measure you're really looking at. We talked earlier about borescopes, right? I love using borescopes. Um, and my sort of rule of thumb is if I see something that looks bad, I wanna send the device back. So if I see a tear, a gouge, a crack, um, something scraped off from within the device, all of those are gonna essentially adulterate that device and, and make it not what the manufacturer tested reprocessing on, right? And the reason I bring that up is that if I can't guarantee reprocessing because I've got a damaged instrument, then I need to send that bronchoscope back. Right. And sort of the last piece here is device culturing. And this is a whole different animal. Um, I've done lots of device culturing in the urology space, GI space, and certainly in the uh, bronchoscopy space. And it is a very sort of fluid uh, process is what I'll say. Um, it is not something that is consistent. 
you have to make sure that you have an environmentally certified lab. So your hospital lab is not going to meet that criteria. Um, and so a lot of facilities, especially those in, involved in outbreak investigation, have said, well, I can't actually get the organism to grow on the device, so the device must be fine. Well, when that device is sent to a properly trained lab and they use the correct uh, laboratory enrichment methods, they can recover the organism. Um, I've seen this happen multiple times with devices I've sent to CDC, where nobody at the state lab, nobody at the outside lab, nobody at the hospital could recover the pathogen, but the CDC laboratory team did. Um, and so device culturing is a pretty finicky piece, um, and it also requires a lot of time and expertise, um, and you wanna hold those devices, uh, preferably, before putting those back into service so it can cause you to have a lot more inventory uh, than what you probably do now. So they sort of ended the, the safety alert with really looking at sort of this principle of next generation medical devices, right? What are some things that based on identified risk, we can turn around from a manufacturer standpoint to say to the, the people that make these devices, this is what we want in the devices. We want smooth surfaces. We want the ability to disassemble it so that we can see it. Uh, we want to have sort of clear identification of, of you know, accessories. We want to make sure that we know that that device has been reprocessed preferably or it, it can't be reused. Um, what about sort of disposable components for hard to reach areas, right? That's one sort of philosophy. Again, we'll talk about that tiered system here in just a minute. Um, and then also about ways that we can look at the flow of both fluids, things like water, um, you know, suction equipment, and also devices um, that might be passed through that instrument to look for signs of debris and buildup. Again, those are all contributors to biofilm formation. So there are ways that we can eliminate, you know, risk, right? And we don't often have that opportunity in, in, in sort of healthcare, but this is one area where we do, right? And so if we think about maintaining clinical operations, right, especially during a pandemic, how can we sort of eliminate the need for excess personnel for potential issues? Um, you know, if somebody said, well, you know, that person before me had COVID and now I have COVID, it must be the bronchoscope. Maybe it's not even related at all. Um, but there is going to be that perception because they're having a pulmonary procedure, right? And so those single-use devices can do a couple of things. One is they can ensure the availability of those devices for anybody. Um, so if it's a night or weekend type issue and it's emergency at the ICU, they need to do a bedside bronch, then you have the ability to do that. You don't have to page somebody in to come do that. Um, reprocessing. I've, I've worked with many healthcare facilities and they say, well, you know, I came in on Monday and there was a bronchoscope in the sink waiting for me because there was nobody there um, for the past two days to, to clean and disinfect it. Well, that's not a good solution. We know that especially you can have a fixative property um, as things are sitting in liquids, especially where those microorganisms are going to affix themselves to the device itself. But we've also got to be realistic and realize that, especially with COVID, we've learned about facility back orders and manufacturer back orders where maybe something wasn't available. And so I'm a really big fan of don't put every single egg in one basket. Um, we're going to still maintain, even if you go sort of down the pathway of single use, you want to make sure you maintain some fleet, right, of reusable devices as a backup plan. There may be issues with, you know, availability. Maybe there's an issue with a particular type of monitor you need to use or an accessory. Right. But most often, you know, that's going to be the, the absolute safer way to go because it eliminates that risk. And this is going to also allow us to have those emergency bedside bronx where we can just toss the thing in the, in the trash um, after use and not have to reprocess it. So for the last year and a half, I've been telling people that we need to focus really deeply in these three buckets. Right. And I think you can all relate to this in some form or fashion. It's all about trust and transparency. Um, and we know that we have an issue with medical devices, particularly endoscopes and absolutely bronchoscopes, but we've not done a ton of stuff as an industry to really fix it. Um, we're just now seeing, you know, innovative new devices come out, which is awesome. Uh, we're seeing improvements in, in reprocessing somewhere, uh, but not a lot of places. And so we've got a lot of room to grow there. And hopefully we're seeing changes in personnel and the way that we train them. But if we think about evidence-based practice, right, there's sort of three big buckets. There's things that we absolutely know. Those are the things that are proven in the literature. We've got good peer-reviewed evidence that says, yes, this works. There's sort of things that we have an idea that work, but we're not 100% you know, sure, right? And I really sort of classify those as expert opinion or consensus driven. And then we have a pretty large bucket, right, that especially in this space of things we just don't know. Um, you know, what may that be? 
Um, it may be associated with devices. It may be associated with reprocessing of personnel. Uh, what's the right solution? Maybe we don't know. And we've got to not be afraid to tell people that. Um, if I don't know what the true risk of having water sit in a, a bronc for 30 minutes is, then let's say that. But if I know what it is at 90 minutes, then we can sort of hypothesize um, the overall risk. And, and that sort of leads me into a make it work approach where I'm gonna leverage what I call the three Ps, people, process, and product in that order. Do I have the right frontline personnel that are properly trained, right? That are gonna be really you know, in tune with my process um, do I have processes in place that actually make sense, that are validated, that are sustainable and are reliable, right? And the key in that sentence is reliability. We have found that regardless of what the device is, it doesn't matter what the type of endoscope is, I've yet to find people have reliable reprocessing processes. And that's across the country and across the world. And I've traveled uh, several places around the world looking at this issue. And I've yet to find a place that does this consistently well. And lastly is sort of the product perspective. You know, what do I need to do to make it work for the patients that I serve? Uh, do I serve a very high risk patient population? Uh, do I serve a, a, a group that has got a lot of oncological issues? You know, if I'm a cancer facility, you absolutely better believe I'm gonna be looking at single use. Um, if I'm a trauma center in you know, uh, inner city and I've got lots of different diversity in my patient population and lots of multi-drug resistant organisms, then I'm gonna think about that as well. So it really depends on what your overall facility risk assessment is, right? And that allows us to have this conversation of bridging the gaps. Right? What can I do to break down the risk associated with patient issues? Um, how do I have that conversation? Uh, most physicians especially have not had this conversation and they don't want to. Um, it's a really sort of delicate thing that you have to walk a tightrope uh, of sort of telling the patient what you're doing, what the known risks are, um, but also what their responsibilities are in this equation as well. And I really focus in on all the steps that we take as an institution to reduce overall risk. You know, I can tell them, hey, we sterilize the device or we use a single use or, you know, this device is serviced every three months and it's only required to be serviced once a year. Uh, whatever it may be, you want to tell the patient that. Um, and so that's going to help us sort of advance evidence-based practice, but also fundamentally figure out sort of this reimbursement or, you know, pay strategy. Um, if I've got a device that's several thousand dollars, then that may be cost prohibitive. Um, and so without the proper reimbursement scheme, that can be difficult for facilities to adopt. So how do I build overall trust, right? Now, I'll just sort of tell you my philosophy is when I go into the hospital or any healthcare facility, um, my expectation is to leave that place and at least the same condition, hopefully better than when I walked in, right? And I think we can all share that same expectation of safe, reliable care. That is not, however, what we see in healthcare all the time. We know that one in 10 patients are going to experience a medical error. That is tragically unfortunate. Um, you know, what can we do to overall re reduce that risk? What is the patient's actual perception? Um, you know, I've yet to find somebody who says, yeah, I'm okay if you use that endoscope on me if it's got a little bit of bugs on it, right? There's, you know, just a little bit left behind. That's okay. They have an expectation and they think that these devices are sterile, right? And they're not. Um, you know, all too often we see this in dentistry and other places where they feel like all of those devices are sterile, but, but they're not. They're just really clean, um, if, if that. And so our patient is really going to drive a lot of our core performance and expectation, right? Is their expectation to just reduce? Is it a prevent? Uh, certainly, I think most patients would say, I don't want to develop some type of healthcare associated injury, right? Something that was caused by the receipt of healthcare services. And at some point, you have to say, how do I mitigate the risk? And what level of risk am I willing to accept? You know, when I think about PPE, right, during COVID, you know, I was not in a position to accept any risk. Um, I did not want anyone to have a issue with their PPE. So we went to extraordinarily sort of links to get PPE. Um, we, we bought it from places we've never even heard of before, all in an effort to make sure that we eliminated that risk to our healthcare team. We wanted to mitigate that risk, um, make sure that they knew that we were there to prevent injury. And our patients have that same expectation when they come in for either an elective or an emergency bronchoscopy. So what about evidence-based practice, right? We know that evidence-based practice is really built on sort of three fundamental areas. You know, one is all about what does the patient think? right? Sort of what are their values and preferences? How are they sort of playing into this equation? We've got clinical judgment, right? And everybody's clinical judgment is going to be slightly different. 
Um, hopefully it's always going to err on the side of safety for the patient. But all too often, sometimes we see people that, you know, due to fatigue, they don't necessarily make the best of decisions. And then what about that relevant scientific evidence? Um, and is it relevant to our area? Um, are there things that have been published in the GI space with the RCPs that, you know, we can pull over and say, we need to apply these in the bronchoscopy space? Absolutely. Um, are there things that are a lot of commonalities? You better believe it, right? And so that evidence-based medicine is really going to be that sweet spot there. And it's not always possible to develop things with randomized controlled trials. It just may not be there, right? But again, our information is, is got to get to every single bedside so that all patients have that benefit. So one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time doing is sort of thinking about future challenges and preparedness, right? And I found that one of the absolute most important things that we can do here is just general planning, right? How do we make sure that individuals, healthcare facilities, um, health systems, patients, individual physicians are all thinking about the future challenges associated with healthcare delivery? Um, and, and I really try to advocate strongly for let's not go back to what we used to do before from an infection prevention standpoint, but really say, let's take the best practices, the things that really worked and we thought made a difference during COVID and apply those to our future, right? Appropriate use of PPE, hand hygiene, disinfection of surfaces, uh, properly cleaning medical devices or disinfecting and reprocessing those. Those are all gonna be keys to maintaining clinical operations and continuity of care. We can't afford to shut down healthcare. Right, we've been there, done that, and it was, you know, horrifically impactful financially, clinical practice oriented, clinical outcomes. We've seen so many people now that, you know, have more aggressive cancer because they were missed, as just an example. And part of this requires us to think strategically outside of the box. And we're all guilty of this. We get sort of wrapped up in what we do and, and our sort of group thinking of our own institution. Um, and, and I really like to go to professional meetings and listen to other webinars or even read articles, you know, maybe things that are not peer reviewed, but maybe in sort of a, um, you know, a non-journal like a magazine, because it gives me different perspective. Um, I love to hear other opinions and other ideas. Um, and that really allows us to sort of take it the next step in advanced clinical practice to say that we don't have all the answers and neither does anyone else, but together that collective sort of brain power is hugely helpful. So there are some different ways that are stepwise to address this issue associated with medical device safety with bronchoscopes, right? And there's sort of four different levels is sort of the way that my brain thinks about this. You can be at any of these levels within your own institution and every hospital or, or facility is gonna be slightly different, right? So if you have sort of reusable devices, we'll start there. Right. One of the first things that we can do is to figure out how do we optimize those current reusable devices by getting the reprocessing process better. Um, maybe we optimize the IFUs, maybe we optimize the training, uh, maybe we do things with the device to make it a little bit easier to clean and disinfect. But we found that that's really not a sustainable solution. And I've, I've yet to find any endoscope, bronchoscope, uh, anything in neurology, or, or the GI space that truly 100% of the time can be reliably clean, just haven't found it. Um, and so that tells us that we have sort of an overall device related issue challenge associated with this. The second thing that we can do is look at reusable devices that have disposable and even potentially sterile high risk components, right? You know, we did this in the ERCP space where we had duodenoscopes that that distal end in that elevator was a known risk. And so there were companies that came out with sterile caps that incorporated those that you could just toss at the end. And that was a great advancement, right? But again, it doesn't get to the FDA's mission, which is elimination of risk when at all possible. So sort of that third piece is we can look at change in reprocessing from high level disinfection to sterilization, improve that margin of safety. But again, that's a balancing act because we know that sterilization in almost all cases is really gonna decrease the shelf life um, of those devices because they're just not designed for that. Uh, sterilization can be very aggressive on these devices and so it can be problematic um, for maintaining your fleet. And then sort of the last and most progressive approach, which is really what FDA's you know, added to this safety alert is to look at using a, a single use device, right? That's sterile. Um, because we know that if we get rid of the actual reprocessing uh, tasks, then we don't have that risk. Now, there could be other risks associated with that, but those are not related to reprocessing, and they're not related to healthcare-associated infections, and that is a massive thing that I can very effectively eliminate and check off my box to say that can't happen because we're only using this device for one single patient. And that really gets us to this hierarchy of controls that CDC refers to quite frequently. 
at the very bottom, you'll see the things that are least effective, like personal protective equipment. You know, sort of a, a joke there because we think about how much emphasis we put on PPE during COVID-19, right? But it is the least effective way at actually stopping transmission and risk. But at the very top, you see that we have the opportunity to eliminate or physically remove the hazard. So if I swap those reusable devices and use a single-use bronchoscope, then I'm eliminating that risk because it's a sterile single-use device that's never going to touch another patient. As long as we handle it correctly and don't contaminate it when we open it and use it, then we're golden, right? And I'm all in favor of doing anything I can to eliminate human variability, but also eliminate risk when at all possible. And a lot of this takes a very strategic team dynamic, right? It is not just the folks in the bronchoscopy suite. It is not just the physicians. It's not just the nurses. It really relies upon the infection preventionists. It relies upon folks that work in risk management. Um, I see this evening, we've got several colleagues from our national GPOs, right? They play a huge role in vetting these types of products. Uh, we've got biomedical engineering that's gonna be responsible a lot of times for our maintenance, right? And so this is going to take sort of a very comprehensive approach uh, that we've got to think diligently through. And last but not least is sort of this concept of training, right? And I really hate the word training because it, it implies that there is some type of innate competency there, but in reality, that's just not the case, right? And I think we can all relate to either sitting in a training class ourselves or you sent someone to a training class and they came back and you thought, did you absolutely learn anything? Because your level of competency has not changed whatsoever. Um, and and I, I look at folks that are really well credentialed and they are absolutely you know, stupid. Um, they don't have any ability to really translate their supposed knowledge into clinical practice, right? And that's a great academic exercise, but we need practicality. We need folks that have competency at the bedside that can really, really advance clinical practice and improve patient safety. So as we uh, sort of get to the question and answer piece for this evening's program, I wanna leave you with a couple uh, key thoughts here. You know, number one is look at your existing risk associated with your devices, right? How are you using those bronchoscopes? Where are those procedures being performed? Is it just in the pulmonology suite? Is it going to be throughout the hospital, maybe in the emergency department, in the intensive care setting, right? And look at your existing process. How are those things gonna be reprocessed? Are there different um, opportunities for improvement or risks that you identify there? Take a look at your current training, right? And how confident do you feel that if an outside agency came in, right, and then really looked at the competency of your individuals, do you have the right level of competency? Um, that's been a question that's come up multiple times in lawsuits, is when's the last time that you received training on this? Who provided the training? Um, do you have documentation that you were deemed competent at that time, right? And so anytime I teach a class, I not only sign for the student that, you know, they perform the skill, but I also ask the, the, the student or the healthcare professional to sign next to me to say that they also feel that they have that competency. And it's a great CYA activity um, anytime you think about competency-driven activities. We can also move the needle towards elimination of risk, right? Remember that four-phase approach that I just talked about. Maybe you're at that reusable phase and you're trying to optimize what you do. Maybe you go to a disposable high-risk component if that's commercially available. Maybe you move to sterilization or maybe you get to sort of that golden Buddha of get to that single-use device that's sterile, right? Again, if I have the opportunity to eliminate a risk from an infection prevention standpoint, that's what I'm going to do. I want to take any and all risk that I'm able to remove from the system and the equation out as much as possible. And then lastly is really maintain that attitude of open and transparent conversation, right? We need to have those conversations with our patients. We need to understand their risk and understand their concerns and share with them actually what we do um, each and every day. So here's the continuing education uh, information again. Um, you know, you will receive that uh, most likely by Friday, if not by Monday. Um, if you don't receive it for whatever reason, you're welcome to send an email. Um, if you only need a certificate of completion and you're not a nursing professional, we're happy to provide those as well. And you're welcome to just send an email um, to that email address and we'll generate those uh, for you in case you need those for other uh, certifications that you might hold. So with that, I'll stop and see if there's any questions. Um, or, or any comments. And Jason, it looks like you joined us, so I'll let you uh, um, go ahead and open up the Q&A since you were able to uh, get your technical issues working. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Garrett. At this time, we'll now open the program for question and answer from the audience. As a reminder, to ask a question, please type your question in through the chat box located at the right-hand side of your computer screen. And all chats will be answered in the order in which they are received. 
I will now allow Dr. Garrett to answer your questions that you have submitted through the chat box. Thank you very much, Jason. I'm glad you were able to join us. So a couple of people had sent in, I'm just gonna group these questions because uh, some of them are very similar. Um, so the first question is, is do you see that hospitals should take this safety alert and share it with their risk managers? Um, absolutely. Um, you know, we all get too many emails. Um, so, you know, myself included. And, and so I know it's very difficult to keep up with that type of stuff, but risk management should certainly be aware of this. Uh, you know, I have the unfortunate reality of my little brother working for a very large, uh, litigation firm that looks at malpractice and a whole bunch of other stuff. And so he's taught me a few things over the years. And one of those is really look at the precedent that's set and sort of what does the government entity that regulates that category say about risk? Um, and so here we know that we've got not one, but two safety alerts. We've got several hundred, almost a thousand um, known MDRs associated with the bronchoscope space. Um, and so there's sort of an impetus for us to do something. Right, whether that's evaluate our process and figure out what we're doing, is it, is it working? Um, but it's not a sort of one-time activity. Uh, we need to do it multiple times throughout the year. And that honestly also includes even if you use single use. We can't take our eye off the prize and say, just because we use single use devices, everything's fine. It really requires us to make sure we maintain those devices and use them appropriately and that we don't contaminate them when we open them. You know, what if you take them out and store them outside of their sterile packaging? It's, what I've seen in some other places um, as well. So just, just something to really think about from that perspective. Uh, the next question that came in is, is the FDA safety alert legally binding for us as a facility? Is this something that we should discuss with our attorney? Um, so, so no, the, the FDA is not um, a, a regulator of the practice of medicine. So if you're looking for sort of regulatory requirements, those would always come through the channels of like Joint Commission or DNV or CMS. Um, even CDC does not have the ability to regulate the practice of medicine. Uh, they can put out guidelines and recommendations all day long, but it doesn't require a hospital or a healthcare facility to do those things. Um, so this is not legally binding. However, right, if there's ever any type of legal action taken, this is certainly one of the first places that attorneys will go look and they'll say, well, back in 2015 and again in 2021, there was a safety alert with this data that came out and this is the exact same um, outbreak or type of risk that happened in your facility. Why did you not know about this, right? And so there's certainly that possibility associated with that, but not legally binding, but excellent question. Uh, the next question is, do you think that physicians should be talking to every patient about the risk associated with reusable bronchoscopes um, before every procedure is part of the informed consent? Uh, I don't think it has to be the physician as much as it can be a, a well-trained member of the team, whether that's a reprocessing technician, um, a nurse, it certainly could be a physician, a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, whoever it is um, would need to be properly trained on having that conversation but I do really feel strongly that it's part of that informed consent process, right? You know, I remember when I had my own sinus surgery and he, he went through all the different things and I looked at the form and it, you know, of course said that you could die. Um, and that was the first time I had signed that form as the person signing it, right? I had administered it multiple times and given it to folks, but I'd really never sat there as a patient and thought about that. Um, and I started asking questions and he said, that really freaked you out, didn't it? And I said, yeah, it did. It really brought to light some of the potential consequences of what you call a basic surgical procedure, but what I may not. Um, and so I do think it would be best practice to train a couple different individuals on your team to have those conversations with uh, the patients proactively and be proud of what you do, right? If you sterilize those devices, then let those patients know how you validate that. Um, if you're on a journey towards sterilization, then great, tell them that. Um, if you are to use a single-use device, then shout it to the to the roof, right? Let everybody know that you're using that. Um, but I, I do think it's it's not going to be any longer appropriate to just sort of hide behind the wall of I'm the healthcare provider, you're the patient, right? And, and that's going to take some time, and, and that's going to require people to really engage in the process. But it is all about the best interest of patient safety for sure. Uh, the next question is: You had mentioned that COVID had prompted some folks to use single-use. Um, devices, is there anything unique about the COVID virus that we should be aware of as it relates to reprocessing? So there was some general thought initially about uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is what causes COVID, 
um, not being responsive to HLD. That was quickly disproven. So that was some unfortunate misinformation out there. So even low and intermediate level disinfectants are very effective against that particular virus, um, whether it's on a medical device or on an environmental surface. But keep in mind with the bronchoscope, we have to have the chemical contact all of the areas, right? And so there's potential for that organism to get left behind. Um, and it can survive for a period of days or weeks, depending upon which study you look at. So I would sort of start there and, and really look at it from that perspective uh, for sure. But there's nothing unique as a from sort of an inactivation or killing of that organism that we have to be worried about. It's really just making sure the chemical can work. Um, and again, if you're you know, using sterilization, that's gonna take care of it, HLD will take care of it. And if you're using a single use sterile device, of course the device is not gonna come with any pathogen in the first place. And that's one of the reasons that I, I really think about that heavily as a patient is, if I can do something, even if I have to pay for it, but I know that it's never gonna be used on anyone else and it's only gonna be for me and it comes sterile and the packaging is intact, that just gives me a lot of um, relief if you will, from an anxiety standpoint about known um, sort of infection risk associated with devices. Uh, the next question is, is, do you think things will change as we do bronchoscopy related to COVID? I know tonight's program was not about COVID, um, but you, you, it looks like you're asking about sort of PPE changes. So if you're asking about what we should do differently with bronchoscopy, you know, really consider bronchoscopy, generally speaking, as an aerosol generating procedure. We know that that's sort of at the very high threshold of innate risk to us as healthcare team members um, with COVID. And so that would be really strongly advisable to have an N95 or higher respirator. Um, I would even look at an elastomeric respirator. They're fantastic. They're a lot more comfortable. They perform well. Um, they, they really last for long periods of time. And then also eye protection. Um, so I think that those are really, really important things. If you're not physically, you know, touching the patient or anything like that, a, a gown is really not near as necessary um, as the respiratory and eye protection. But, you know, at least for the time being, I would stay along those lines as far as PPE, uh, just to make sure that your, your team members are all um, safe. And it looks like I have one more question in the queue. Um, so again, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop those in and I'll be happy to address those um, as I'm able. So the last question it looks like is, do you see that we should be moving towards single use for all endoscopes, not just bronchoscopy? I heard you mention the risk associated with ERCP. Um, I don't work in the GI space, but I've heard this from my colleagues that there's lots of known risk. So, you know, ERCPs really are what kick this off. Um, you know, several years ago, and FDA took a pretty comprehensive approach in saying, we need to first study and understand this. And so they commissioned what they called a 522 study uh, to determine whether or not the devices that were reprocessed according to the manufacturer's IFUs were safe um, after, after reprocessing. And they found that in many instances, they were not. The second aspect of that was they looked at sort of the human factors engineering and said, can I actually you know, do this correctly each and every time? Can I train reprocessing technicians or nurses? And is that process reliable? Um, is it something that we can do every single time? And the answer is no. There's just huge variability associated with that that can be problematic. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the concept of a single use device applies across all endoscopes. They have very similar features, whether it's in the urology space, bronchoscope, um, or your ERCP. The difference with ERCP is that we know we're going from sort of a contaminated area, right, into a sterile body cavity. Um, and that's why we also see a lot of pancreatitis and things like that. And so the adverse event profile of that is higher. Um, because of the known risk of moving from one area of the body that is, is really you know, riddled with common bacteria to an area that is not. Um, and so we're essentially taking everything that's associated with that device, especially that distal end and that elevator, into that new sterile body area. Um, so bronchoscopy certainly has risk associated with that. Um, I have tend to sort of look at this in a generic sense and say, how do I look at all these endoscopes and figure out what's going to make the most sense long term? Um, and again, my philosophy has always been if I can eliminate the risk, that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, just like if I could have a COVID vaccine that was 100% effective, that's what I would do, right? But having one that's 95% effective with our mRNA vaccines is really exciting. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm glad to see that folks have heeded the warnings associated with medical devices um, that FDA has put out and, and people have brought good solutions to the market. We need to continue to see more of those um, and more adoption as well. <clears throat> So Jason, I don't see any other um, 
uh, comments in the chat. Um, so I'll go ahead and let you make some closing comments. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Garrett, for your insightful presentation this evening. Uh, no, I'm confident that each of us can take valuable information from today's program back to our own clinical practice settings. Uh, we appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today during today's webinar. We hope that you have enjoyed today's webinar program. As a reminder, nursing professionals will receive an email from Terry Goodman and Associates within five days of the conclusion of today's webinar program. If you have any questions regarding claiming your continuing education credit, please contact continuing education at chaassociates.com. To learn more about future educational webinar programs, please visit our website. This concludes today's program, so you may now disconnect. Thank you for joining, and most importantly, thank you for the work you do each day in caring for patients.